Hi, and welcome to a lecture on analysis of a corner reflector using image theory. Here's a sketch of a corner reflector. The reflector consists of plates which are joined at an angle alpha, as is indicated in this diagram. The feed consists of an electric line source, which is oriented perpendicular to the screen. The distance between the vertex of the reflector and the feed is D, and the width of each plate is W. You may notice some similarity to a parabolic reflector, and there is a roughly similar method of operation. However, whereas a parabola would collimate radiation from the feed, that is, make all the reflected rays travel in the same direction to the far field, the geometry of the corner reflector clearly cannot do that. All the corner reflector can do is limit the amount of feed power that ends up in the shadow region behind the plates. It is the mechanical simplicity of the system that makes it compelling as an alternative to the parabolic reflector in certain applications. Also, I'll mention that a corner reflector is sometimes useful as a simple model for certain kinds of horn antennas, although we won't get into that in this lecture. In this study, we're going to analyze a special case in which alpha, that angle between the plates, is 90 degrees. This is going to let us invoke image theory, and you knew that was coming from the title of this lecture. The idea in image theory is simply that you can transform problems consisting of flat conducting surfaces into similar problems having additional sources but without the conducting surfaces. With only sources and no scattering surfaces, problems become very simple to analyze, and that will certainly be the case here. This will be a study in two dimensions. Essentially, we will be assuming that the reflector and line source are infinite along the z-axis. This may seem a bit weird at first, but in fact we will find that most of the relevant behaviors and conclusions emerge from the 2D analysis. If you find the idea of 2D analysis unfamiliar or unsettling, please check out a previous video by me with the title Electromagnetics in Two Dimensions. And also note that I have analyzed other antennas in other videos using this approach, including some videos on cylindrical parabolic reflectors. Honestly, even if you aren't familiar with electromagnetics in two dimensions, you will probably have no problem following this lecture. The information we would like to get out of the analysis here includes the usual antenna metrics, namely pattern, directivity, and beam width. Okay, so here's how we do this problem using image theory. Image theory tells us to replace the corner reflector with three additional line sources, as shown here. Each line source is the same distance from the origin, and the upper and lower line sources are oriented in the reverse direction from the feed and the leftmost line source. The line source at y equals plus d stands in for reflection from the upper plate. Similarly, the line source at y equals minus d stands in for reflection from the lower plate. The line source at x equals minus d stands in for double reflections, that is, cases where the radiation from the feed is first reflected from one plate and then the other plate. This modeling of double reflections is also why the direction of current is opposite that of the other two line sources. Not indicated here, but important to know, is that the magnitude of the current on each of the additional line sources is the same as that for the feed. Together, these three additional sources account for all of the possible reflections when the vertex angle is 90 degrees. By the way, if you'd like to see this described in a textbook, a decent reference is Stutzman and Thiel, 3rd edition, section 6.6.2. Before moving on, I need to make one other important point. Note that the width of the plate, that is W, has vanished from the problem. This should alert you to a shortcoming of this method of analysis. Clearly, the width of the plates should play some role in the behavior of the scattered fields. In this particular problem, however, it turns out that the value of W does not make much difference as long as W is large compared to a wavelength and W is not smaller than D. If those two conditions are true, then this image theory model will be able to do a decent job modeling what is going on within the 90 degree region containing the feed. Otherwise, you can expect that diffraction from the edges of the plates might significantly affect the results inside this 90 degree region, 
and in that case you need to account for that diffraction separately. More on that at the end of this video. One final comment is that this image theory model is of course invalid for field points outside the 90 degree region containing the feed. In this remaining 270 degrees, we are saying essentially that the field is exactly zero. In order to account for the small and non-zero field in that region, we would once again have to account for diffraction. As I explained in the previous slide, three additional line sources stand in for reflections from the plates. One other thing to keep in mind is that the contribution to the field from the feed directly is going to be relatively important for a corner reflector. This is very much unlike what normally happens for a parabolic, that is for a collimating reflector, where a well-designed feed typically does not contribute much directly to the far field, only through reflection. Okay, so now let's label the contributions to the far field from each one of these line sources. We have E sub F from the feed, and then E sub 1, E sub 2, and E sub 3 for the new line sources above, below, and behind the vertex, respectively. Further, we can immediately write an expression for E sub F as shown here. E sub F will be, of course, oriented in the z-hat direction, that is, out of the page, and we'll have some complex-valued coefficient E sub naught. Taking the distance from the feed to the field point to be S sub F, we'll have a phase factor E to the minus J K S sub F, where K is the phase propagation constant, 2 pi divided by wavelength. And then this gets divided by the square root of S sub F, which is the spread factor for a cylindrical wave. We add to that the contribution from the line source at y equals plus d. This expression is, of course, essentially the same except for the sine and also s sub f becomes s sub 1. And we'll do exactly the same thing for the other two line sources with associated distances s sub 2 and s sub 3. To get the total field, we'll simply add these contributions. Since they are all either plus or minus z hat polarized, we can do this as a scalar operation, as shown here, and again, yay for two-dimensional analysis. Making the substitutions, we obtain the scalar expression shown here. Now we can invoke the far field magnitude approximation. That is, in the far field, the small differences in the distances in the denominators of each term have negligible effect. So we can approximate all four distances, S sub F, S sub one, S sub two, and S sub 3 as the single distance rho, and then extract that common factor of the square root of rho as I've shown here. As usual, we cannot similarly simplify the distances in the phase factors, that is, at least not without losing something. But, as usual, we can invoke the far field parallel ray approximation to simplify those phase factors. Here's the math for implementing the parallel ray approximation. This is the usual routine, and for each distance we are left with a common distance rho from the origin to the field point, plus a term that corresponds to the change in distance associated with the geometry of the ray. Easy peasy. Now making those approximations, we've reduced the original expression to the far field expression shown here. Now we can simplify this expression quite a bit. You know that whenever you see sums of complex exponentials having exponents with opposite sign, these are actually cosine functions. So what we can do here is reduce these two pairs of complex exponentials to two cosine functions, as shown here. This is the expression we were looking for. Now all that remains is to plot this expression and interpret the results. This plot shows the total far field magnitude in blue. Here I've chosen the distance d to be 1.5 wavelengths. This is a bit larger than the values typically used for corner reflectors, which are usually closer to 0.5 wavelengths. But this analysis also works for those smaller spacings. There's also a red curve on this plot, and let's just ignore that for a moment. Before plotting, I've divided the equation on the previous slide by e sub naught divided by the square root of rho, 
which normalizes the result relative to the magnitude of the contribution of the feed alone. This is indicated in the label on the vertical scale of the plot. This particular normalization is convenient because it will make it possible to determine directivity in a very simple way, as we will see in a moment. Also, note that the angle span is limited to plus or minus 45 degrees. Outside this span, the image theory model is obviously not valid. I could have, of course, also used the limits plus or minus 180 degrees and simply zeroed the curve outside plus or minus 45 degrees. Now, that red curve, that's simply the three line sources, i.e. not including the feed, that model the reflector scattering. I included that merely to emphasize my previous comment that here, the feed direct radiation does play a significant role in the far field pattern of this antenna. We also have a chance to sanity check our result. The check goes like this. For the normalization that I've made here, the magnitude of the radiation from the feed is simply one. Thus, the maximum array factor for the four line sources together is simply four times one, that is four. The line sources are omnidirectional, so the array factor squared, in this case, gives us the power pattern. And so the maximum value of the power pattern here should be 4 squared, which is 16, which in turn is about 12 dB in linear units. And, of course, this is what we see in the plot as well. The simple check also leads us to a simple way to compute directivity. Directivity is simply power density in the intended direction divided by power density averaged over all directions. The easy way to get the average power density is simply to realize that the average power density from the entire system must be the same as the average power density from the feed alone. So, in the present context, the average power density is just 1. Therefore, the directivity is simply 16 divided by 1, that is, the directivity in linear units is 16. In other words, the particular normalization I've chosen for this plot lets us read the vertical axis as power density divided by average power density, and therefore the directivity is 12 dBi. With this plot in hand, we can obtain the half power beam width simply by reading it off the plot. Here we find the half power beam width is approximately 14 degrees, and that pretty much wraps up the analysis. So now, some concluding remarks. First, I mentioned that corner reflectors typically have D around 0.5 wavelengths, as opposed to the 1.5 wavelengths that I've used in this analysis. Generally, the smaller value of D gives you a simpler pattern that does not have the lobes that you may have noticed in the pattern that I showed. This analysis, however, will work equally well for that smaller spacing. Second, directivity and half power beam width will certainly depend on D and alpha. Now, directivity and half-power beam width typically do not vary so much with W, that is, unless you violate one of the assumptions we mentioned earlier. Third, remember that image theory works only for certain values of alpha and with certain limitations on W. If you need a method with fewer limitations, then here are some ideas. Geometrical optics, that is, GO, could be used. GO accounts for W, and GO might also be a good path to doing the 3D case, where you have to account also for the length of the conducting plates. GO will give you explicitly zero field in the shadow region beyond the plates, unlike image theory, although we know that the field behind the plates is not actually exactly zero. An even more general approach is to use GO and then to add diffraction, for example, using GTD. This will be accurate everywhere except along the shadow boundaries, where GTD has the unfortunate characteristic of predicting infinite magnitude. This is easily fixed by using UTD instead of GTD, so GO plus UTD is probably the best overall way to do this problem. To get started with that approach, a good starting point might be my videos Uniform Geometrical Theory of Diffraction Part 2, example, and Cylindrical Parabolic Antenna, UTD. If you are interested only in what is going on in the angular region that includes the feed, 
Then another pretty good approach is GO with aperture integration. This would be essentially the same method described in my video, GO AI analysis of an axisymmetric paraboloidal reflector. Finally, I'll point out that physical optic surface integration, that is PO, is a poor choice for this problem. The reason is that double reflection contributes significantly to the far field in this system. Now, PO would work fine if there were only single reflections, but there is no way that can account for multiple reflections without some additional work. Now, there is a fix, and it's called Iterative Physical Optics, or IPO. IPO is far more work than is justified in this case, however. That concludes this lecture on Analysis of a Corner Reflector Using Image Theory.